the ground to cover, so we better get into it. Our little chariot has received a few electrical modifications prior to us receiving it. And I'm not only gonna carry on with those modifications, but even expand upon them. So the wiring is gonna be a little bit different to the original product. One example of an upgrade, if you could call it that, is the is those classic pork pie, very expensive rear lights were swapped out for this rather cheap plastic generic thing, which it wasn't this one, the other one was broken in a, a thousand pieces. The dash has a temperature gauge and an oil pressure gauge installed upon it. And these Defender light switches and hazard switch, although they're brand new, I've swapped them out like for like as they came with the truck. And then another example is this multi-switch that does your headlights and your indicators and your horn. And I've swapped that out for a brand new one, which as you can see, is already installed on the truck. So our vehicle's had a few mechanical modifications as well. I suspect the rear diff is from a Series 2A and possibly the front as well. And the engine's different. But they're all concealed. That's all under the hood, so to speak. Something that will betray the original look of the vehicle are these LED Defender running lights. Now they're not an uncommon upgrade for these early series vehicles, but I did grapple with the concept for quite some time. Now, I don't know if our vehicle's ever gonna be licensed for the road, but I hope that it will, and I'm gonna wire it up in preparation for that event. And that's what won out in the end, a common sense safety decision over nostalgia. As I'm not a gifted auto electrician, I've been doing some research for quite some time and I was watching one of my fellow Land Rover restorers, Mr. Corey Anderson, wire up his truck. He's just another one of these outrageously handsome Land Rover guys that are clever and crafty as well. It's a lethal combination. As I was watching what he was doing, it, it, it just dawned on me that left to my own devices, there's too much room for error. And that's what led me down the path of this fuse box. Possibly the most significant electrical upgrade we'll do on this project. It comes from a mob called Classic Technologies and it does a lot of heavy lifting in a small package, but most importantly, it simplifies the wiring process. And it even comes with this giant schematic that's very clear to read and is going to help greatly with our quest. Now, fuse box is sectioned off into three separate compartments, and each one calls for its own individual input wire directly from the battery, which a wise person would install inline fuses into each of them. A 12 gauge wire feeds our red port, which is constant power. Things like hazard lights and your ignition key are two examples of what will be drawing power from this one. A 12 gauge wire feeds our yellow port, which is accessories. So anything that requires the key to be in the ignition is going to be hooked up to that. And the blue one, a 16 gauge wire feeds that, dedicated only for headlights. Alright, so if we have a look at our little machine, you can see that it's jam packed full of relays. And if you were like I was 10 minutes ago, you would know a relay exists but not really understand how it works or what it does. But I've just finished watching a YouTube video on the subject, so now I'm an expert. To unlock some of these magical mysteries ahead of us, we're gonna require some diagrams. So to facilitate this, we have here a magical scrapbook that I got from the dark arts section on eBay. It even comes with a magical wand. So what we need to do is open it up and we have to visualize the image we wanna create. And then with our wand, we wave it across the page and voila, bloody magie, eh? That is an artist's impression of what the inside of a relay may or may not look like. From my understanding, it's generally not a good idea to run a heavy amount of current through automotive switches, so that becomes the job of the relay, which in itself is a heavy duty switch that gets triggered remotely. Headlights are a good example of a unit that generally require relays. So when you turn them on on the dash of your car, what you're really doing is turning on a relay that then turns on the headlights. So we have a closer inspection of the internals of our standard four pin relay. We'll see two pincers there, and one of them is connected to an armature via an insulated link. And this thing here represents a conductor wrapped in copper wire. And if we were to run a small amount of current through that, it creates a thing called an electromagnetic field. Hey, that sort of talk would get us dunked in the river in medieval England with people calling us witches. So let's bring in our fuse box, a switch, connect the wires, and energize it. And there we have it. See what's happening? Off 
on, off, on. Now we can bring in our heavy wire from the fuse box and send one out to a load. Energize that, turn our relay on. And now we're all experts. Well, our original wiring harness is not a relay to be seen and it's pretty beat up. There's a lot of exposed wires and failing connections. So other than reference, we're not gonna use it again. We're gonna start everything anew. Now, as we look at our ignition switch, we can see some of these big heavy wires indicating that the whole current was running through this particular switch, which on a little truck like this probably doesn't matter. But following is going to be an example of where the new fuse box is going to do a lot of the heavy lifting for us. Now, I believe our switch was initially installed somewhere in the center of the dash, but when we got the truck, it had been relocated to the dark recesses at the back of the bulkhead. Our new one is coming onto a plate we constructed and that's going to be installed near the steering wheel and easy access. We'll give it a trial run to see how it works. Work out what's what. We get our voltage meter out and we turn it on to ohms to check for continuity. In the off position, as we check from constant power to the other pins, we just get a big fat one, which means full resistance. There's no connection whatsoever. However, when we give it a click to the left and we check for continuity, those pins down there it suddenly jumps to zero, which means they're connected. We're gonna call that the accessory pins. There is no continuity with the other two. When we click to the right, once again, we get continuity with our accessory pins, but this time the ones here are also connected. Those ones we're gonna call the ignition pins. And then when we go to crank, we get continuity to this lone little chap down there, we're gonna call the starter. So the three wires that exit our switch, the accessories, the ignition, and the starter do no more than send a small signal up to the fuse box to actuate their respective relays. When the accessory relay is actuated, it allows anything that requires that power to draw from the yellow pin. The ignition relay, when actuated, will allow coil and gauges, for instance, to draw from the red pin. And when the starter relay is actuated, the fuse box sends a signal down to the solenoid, which then draws its power directly from the battery, starting the starter motor, and if all goes well, the engine. wires all connected. We've even run a main battery wire through to the starter motor. It was a six foot run. We're using four gauge wire, which should be suitable for a chariot of this size. Now we want to focus on the alternator. And if you can get your head around the back of that, you can see the little port. Our schematic says that there are three wires going in or coming out of it. We need to work out what goes where. This is a Bosch alternator off the V8. And if we have a look at the back of it, it's got the same pins as what's on Lucas, which is a good reason why we didn't throw out our wiring harness to try and track things down to see where they went. So on our rather beat up connector for the alternator, we can see there are three wires as predicted. The middle one, big chunky one. So what we're gonna do is take our continuity testers and we're gonna track down the fat one first. Where the um, ignition goes in, there's one there. So we'll start with that, nothing. And then if we look over where it says starter motor, there's another one. So we'll try that one. Bam, there we go. Okay, so that goes straight to the starter motor. The next one is a little blue and brown. So we'll try and track that down. And I do notice over where the starter motor is, it joins up with that continuity that's good the third one which is in the smaller of the three pins is a brown and yellow and i know where that one goes already that goes up to the to the dash panel in one of the warning lights i think it could be the red one so i'm guessing that's going to be the engine start 
warning light. They're brand new wires and new connector and we're going to snap it into the back of the alternator like such. For our big chunky 8 gauge wire, the schematic calls for that to go back to the battery, but on our original harness it just went to the starter motor, which I kind of think that's the same place. So we're going to opt for the shorter run and go there. Our brown and yellow wire attached to the small pin, that goes to our gauges, so we can route that off. And then for our small wire attached to the big pin, that's got a spot in the fuse box for uh, whatever it does. <laughs> Because our wires are so close to the exhaust, we're going to incorporate a heat shield into these two bolts for the support bracket to protect them. Now with our engine mostly wired up, we can move on to other stuff, but we're going to have a quick introduction to our toggle switch. We have four input wires, one's a ground, the blue one is for headlights, the green one indicators, and the purple is our flasher function on the headlights. As for our output wires, we have another ground. Continuity shows that the green and red is the left indicator. That means green and yellow will be the other one. Then we have blue and white, which will be high beam. And then we have blue and red. Wow, you guessed it. Start with our headlights first. For high beam and low beam are on their own separate circuits and thusly require their own individual relays. Let's bring them in. From here, we're going to run wires through to the light switch, through to the toggle switch. And then we'll run input wires into both the high and low beam relays. Now we can run output wires from both of those relays to the headlights, both high beam and low beam. From the toggle switch, we have two wires that are signal wires for each relay, low beam and high beam. The toggle switch is basically on all the time, it's just ever which way. So let's energize. And now we'll turn our light switch on. And by default, the toggle should be around low beam. And there we have it, eh? Glowing. Now we'll switch our toggle to high beam, switches relays, and the function changes. Just to complicate things a little bit, when you use your headlights, you generally want your running lights to come on and to stay on. And to facilitate this, we have a switch with three positions. Off, half on, and on. Let's bring in our running lights. We'll wire them up, they're all connected, and then we'll also send a wire out to the toggle switch for the headlights. Now let's energize it. We'll turn our switch on to half on, the running lights illuminate. When we turn it to fully on, it sends power out to the toggle switch, that then down to the relays for the headlights, and they become illuminated, just like us. From my understanding, there are different ways to wire up hazard switches, so we'll be discussing our particular scenario. Hazards and indicators use the same lights, yet they have different functions. So they're on different circuits and have their own individual flashes. Our hazard switch does more than just turn the lights on and off. It acts as a gatekeeper. With two trains wanting to use the same track, it only allows one through at any given time. When the hazard switch is in the off position, it allows indicator current to travel through the switch to the toggle switch, which should be set to off by default. Exiting the toggle switch will be two wires. One will service our left indicators, the other the right. Let's energize and test. Now we switch our toggle to the left, off, right. It's working. Now to wire up the hazard compartment, we're going to send two exiting wires out that are going to bypass the toggle switch. One will hook into our left side indicators, the other the right. So when we turn the hazard lights on, with all four now illuminate. Our shiny new running lights come pre-wired with Defender Econoseal connectors, which will not fit either down or up our little grommeted hole that accesses the nether regions beneath the tub. So they're going to have to go. 
Our plan is to extend our reach, so once we're prepared, the additional lengths can be spliced into our lights and soldered to ensure a somewhat more reliable connection. A smear of dialectic grease is given to discourage corrosion. Shrink tubing applied to insulate and protect. For the ends, we resort to smaller connectors. Females are crimped onto the power legs, males will be for the grounds. So that's to avoid any problems if we're not wearing our glasses. So even back in the day, Land Rover understood that beneath the rugged exterior of their clientele was an individual both sophisticated and refined with an appreciation of curvature. And they give it to us right here on this front fender, which can be quite a bugger if you want to install a second light. So if we wanted to get all artsy and abstract, we could use the projectile vomit technique and basically stick our light wherever we chose to on this flat surface. But in all practicality, we are going to be constrained by the latitudinal and longitudinal axis. As for the latter, it's going to interfere with our number plate. And that's a hypocrisy that might need to be addressed right now because I'm installing brand new LED running lights, but yet waffling on about an old number plate. Now, there is no rational explanation for this. I think it might be best if we just embrace the madness. So we are going to be forced to put our light roughly around there. However, the curvature is going to offset it in an upward direction, which technically speaking is going to look kind of crap. So beneath this light here is a stamped section that gives it a flat surface to sit on and allows it to face forward. So I'm not going to be able to replicate that. We need to find ourselves a platform, which I have right here, to offset that curvature and allow the light to sit flat. We made this platform out of body filler, or as my countrymen call it, bog. To construct our platforms, we begin by snipping off a thin strip from the plank to act as our mould's base. On the remaining piece, we have to carefully drill our hole, as there's not much space and we don't want to... Shit! Once successful, we can attach our base and then mix up a pile of goop, enough to fill one of our holes. At which point, we attempt to smooth things out and let it set. Extraction of our asset from the mould does require some gentle force. And there we have it. Vigorous scrubbing on some coarse sandpaper overlaying a flat surface is undertaken for a more polished appearance. Now we cut our creation in half, but on an angle, from thick to thin, or vice versa. Now the undercarriage is given a good scrubbing as we attempt to match the curvature of the front wing. A central hole is drilled for the wires, an attachment point for the light itself. Looking for a little consistency and symmetry. I think I want to put my light in the middle. So we've got 13 inches, so that'll be six and a half to the very center. There. Measuring down to the halfway mark is about roughly an inch and three quarters. There. Our platform will sit like such, and now we can drill our holes. So before we put the body back on the truck, we were wise enough to route the wires through the chassis down to the back to facilitate the rear lights. And what we see here is a common bus bar for all my grounds. I'm trying to, whenever possible, to consolidate them all into one area. If anything goes wrong, then I'll be able to find them easier. Down the back of the truck here, we don't have curvature to concern ourselves with, but we certainly have real estate issues, especially if we want to keep our number plate. Now at the bottom of the tub's just there, means the second light would have to go down here somewhere and it just looks terrible. And then side by side, they just don't fit. So we have a problem. After some deliberation, I came up with this invention. Hmm? Voila, it's a bracket. So this extends our real estate out into space. So if we feed our wires through here, butts up to the back of the truck like such, stays clear of our little hoop hooks and our rear tailgate and number plate. 
And even if we have a look up underneath, eh, on the last visit home at BCF, I found myself a little light. That's going to be our number plate light. A clamp goes onto the back of it like such. And then hopefully our wires fit down that little hole. Our little vehicle's absolutely jam-packed with safety features with our sparkly new running lights, seat belts, and airbags. This big hole here was once the home of a V8 symbol that is no longer with us for obvious reasons. However, with a couple of smaller holes drilled next door to it, it's a good home for a Defender reversing light. Now this is just going to be operated with a manual switch. I'm but an acolyte in the world of wizardry, so you can't expect too much. There you see our airbox turned up. It's a ITG airbox and the pipe is a Revotech air ducting system and you can see how it bends like a slinky holding its position so it's quite handy. I found a shop in the UK called Merlin Motorsports and they have a lot of little solutions for some of this retrofitting business that I'm doing. The airbox is a little springy though. As you can see on the bracket I made there's a second hole there allowing for another strap so that might stabilize things a bit. So the last major circuit we're going to discuss is the radiator fan and if we have a look at the fuse box then number 15 has a 20 amp fuse for just that. So if we track that down on our schematic we see that it runs from one side of the fuse box to the other and incorporates into the spare relay. The manufacturer asked me upon purchase if I wanted the spare relay to be positive or negative actuated and I think I chose positive so it's probably not going to work for us. However, the fan controller comes pre-wired with its own relay so I think we could chuck the hot straight into fuse 15 and it'll be good to go. Personally, when I think of a switch, I see it cutting off the power leg. However, if you disconnect the ground, it's going to have the same effect and a lot of switches do just that. Many sender units, horns, and funnily enough, our fan controller. Now to talk about the circuitry, we're gonna defer back to our magical scrapbook and have a look how it works. From the one circuit, constant power is fed to both relay ports and the fan controller. The black wires for both fan and controller are grounded to the chassis, and the controller's blue wire is connected to the relay ground pin. Once the water temperature rises to its preset tolerance, the controller switch connects its outgoing blue wire to the chassis ground black, grounding and actuating the relay to turn the fan on. As the temp decreases, the switch disconnects the blue from black, opening the circuit and shutting down the fan. Just to confuse things a little, we're going to install an override switch that has three positions, on, off and auto. These wires can create some confusion because of their colour, but in actuality, they're all grounds. And this is how it works. We disconnect the controller's blue wire from relay ground and splice it into the override's red. Override green fills the position in the relay ground pin, and override black goes to the chassis. In the off position, all grounds are cut off, and no matter how hot things get, how much the controller screams in protest, the fan will not come on. In auto, the controller's blue to red wire connects to green, so when the controller's switch reacts to temperature, everything proceeds to plan, as the override switch does what it's told. In the on position, the override connects green with its own chassis grounded black, providing a constant closed circuit as long as power is provided by the ignition accessories. The fan continues to run. So whilst auto is where you'd want to keep it, one scenario where off might be handy is in a deep water crossing where the fan could potentially become submerged. And in the on position, if ever there was a problem with the controller and it wasn't turning on when it should. So 
probably one of the hardest aspects of wiring up the truck is organisation and getting it to look neat. Well, I think we're organised inside and it's time to put the dash panel on. We've got a lot of spaghetti hanging out the back, which is less complicated than it looks. But the spaghetti look is what I'm trying to hide in behind the dash panel and hopefully all the other wiring kind of looks like someone who kind of knew what they were doing did it. And we've got to feed through our uh, choke cable as well. Back when we received the truck, the steering column was adorned in this kind of plastic thing and I think duct tape might have been involved in holding it together. So it's time for it to be retired. I've made my own little atrocity right here, a metal box. It's going to sit over the top like this. At the back are some tabs. They'll be integrated into the steering column clamp. And then underneath you'll see here some set bolts. And that allows a pipe clamp to secure the front. Then once we're all done, we have a bottom plate to go on just to make it look, you know, professional. Now the inside of our thing has had a liberal spray of some rubber sealant for insulation purposes. And we get our continuity testers out. And... Yeah, okay. So what we're going to run these wires into is some pretty high-tech stuff. We've got a 12-volt charger and USB ports as well. So whilst Wilms is pretty hardcore, I need to keep my devices charged at all times. For how are people going to know on Facebook what I've had for breakfast and the TikTokers? How are they going to see my latest rap routine? In truth, I'm not really much of a rapper. More of a Kylie Minogue guy. You better not tell Taylor Swift about that. Now the fuse box is wired, it's time to attach the negative battery cable and heat things up. Wait a second. Oh, I heard a click. There's no smoke. Well, that's not very good, is it, eh? The lights on the dash shouldn't be on if the key's off. Now if we go through checking our ignition wiring, everything seems to be in order. But the one thing that's different would have to be that brown guy that runs back to the alternator in fuse or port 21. That's it. So I'm going to reroute this brown wire back down to the starter motor where it terminated in the original harness. And then we'll come back and we'll, uh, we'll check our work. There's too many people thought this day was ever going to arrive. All right, it's only 
one thing for it now. Fire it up. Ready? Three, two. <gasps> oh, for fuck! <laughs> <laughs>